I like the reindeer hats. It's nice. <laughs> Wonderful. Hey, uh, raise your hand if you have an ornament. Okay, put them down. If you don't have an ornament, you're going to need one in a moment. So raise your hand and we'll bring one to you. If, you. if you need an ornament, raise your hand. We're going to pass them out to you right now. Keep those hands up. I know this is a bit disruptive. We've just lost the flow. <laughs> but we want everybody to have an ornament. While they're handing out the ornaments, so let me announce the scripture reading for today. We'll be reading two lessons. One from Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25, and then Philippians 4, 4 through 7. Let's open up our hearts and minds now for the reading of the Word of God. Now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he'd resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She'll bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place. To fill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet, look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had borne a son and named him Jesus. Philippians 4. Rejoice in the Lord always again. I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving and prayer, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. This is the reading of God's word for God's people. All God's people did say, amen. I made my family disappear. Kevin, you're completely helpless. No, Kevin, you're what the French call les incompetents. Kevin, I'm going to feed you to my tarantula. Kevin, you are such a disease. There are 15 people in this house, and you're the only one who has to make trouble. Look what you did, you little jerk. I made my family disappear. So I, I'd be very surprised if anyone has not seen this movie. In fact, I was quite shocked to learn earlier that Kathy Venable says she's never seen it. Told me after that, I can't believe it, Kathy. You're not, neither has Amy. Well, wow. You'll have to watch it. But it's a very, very popular movie that is seen over and over again, and it's about families. 
It's not about the Kevin Howe family. It's about the Kevin McAllister family. The McAllister family is planning a big vacation. They're going overseas to Paris, and the house is full of people. Everybody's getting ready to go. They're packing their bags, and Kevin, little Kevin, is a lot of trouble. Kevin is just this little boy who's always finding a way to find trouble, and trouble always finds him. Everyone's always picking on Kevin. He feels like he's completely misunderstood. Everybody in his family is just angry with Kevin. So Kevin says to his mom, this house is full of so many people. I'm sick of them all. I hate my family. Someday when I grow up, I'm going to get married and live all by myself. I hate my family, he says. I just wish they would all disappear. And his mom says, well, if you hate your family so much, then why don't you ask Santa for a new family this year? She then sends Kevin upstairs to the third floor bedroom where he has to sulk and miss dinner while everybody makes their plans for the next day. Then, power outage. The alarms don't go off, the clocks are reset, the family wakes up at the last minute and they have to rush out of the house in a hurry. They get in the car, they drive to the airport, they're on the plane before they realize they've left Kevin home alone. Now Teresa and I have watched this film so many times and the last time we watched it I hit the pause button and I said to her, I like the movie but it's just not believable. Who would leave their son home alone at Christmas? I mean, what family, what sort of family would forget their youngest child? She smiled at me and she says, you would. (laughs) She said, do you remember that time you went to Steinmark and I wasn't with you? How you bent over to try on a pair of shoes? You pulled the box off the shelf. I pulled the box off the shelf, put on my shoes, and in a matter of a few minutes, that I put on my shoes, my four-year-old son, Alex, completely vanished. You probably had that experience. You turn around and they're gone. Where are they? And you begin to immediately worry. Well, the worry went to a full-fledged panic when I walked around the store for a few minutes and couldn't find him. Then I totally lost it. They locked down the store, got on the intercom, and he still, wouldn't, he still wasn't found. He didn't answer the calls. We didn't know where he was. Everyone in the store is looking for him. And then suddenly, at the last minute, he jumps out of a clothing rack and says, Boo! <laughs> hey, you go to Steinmark to play hide and go seek. And Teresa says, if you were a single parent, our son would not have survived. Don't judge me. (laughs) Because it happened to Mary and Joseph. Do you remember the story? Mary and Joseph, Jesus is about the same age as Kevin. Eight or nine years old, they they go to Jerusalem, and it's a big religious festival. It's a big crowd of people, and they are on their way home back to Nazareth. They're going a full day when Mary looks at Joseph and says, where's Jesus? And Joseph said, I thought he was with you. Well, I thought he was with you. And suddenly they realized they forgot, they forgot the Son of God. <laughs> imagine the panic. Imagine the conversation. They're rushing back to Jerusalem. And notice the detail in the story. And the detail in the story is it took them three days to find him. And when they did find him, they found out like Kevin from home alone, he knew how to took care of himself, except he wasn't tormenting, tormenting burglars. He was tormenting religious leaders. Of course, where would I be but in my father's house? So, let's just say this. If it's possible to lose the Son of God, anyone could forget their children. (laughs) And maybe you want to. So, underline this truth. When you're leaving home, do a head count when you get in the car. The other thing about the story that I find to be somewhat unrealistic is if it happened today, it wouldn't happen today because Kevin would have an iPhone, he'd be live tweeting his experiences, he'd be posting selfies in cyberspace, and his mom could have FaceTimed him from the, from the plane, right? But there is an important message behind the humor in this story. This is a message about family. 
tucked in the humor of the story is how sometimes families can be lonely places. Kevin, in this story, feels misunderstood. Kevin feels unloved and unappreciated. Kevin feels alone in the middle of a family. Sometimes in the church family, you can feel all alone. Sometimes in your own family, you can feel all alone with your struggles. And I like this story because, well, you may not want Santa to bring you a new family. You're stuck with the one that you have. But the reality is that all of us have family struggles. There are no perfect families. We have discord. We have estrangement. uh, We have heartaches. We have grief. We have sorrow. We have sadness. Every family, no matter what kind of family it is. Think for a minute about your family. What is the one thing in your family that worries you? What is the one thing in your family that makes you anxious? Who is the person in your family you're most concerned about? What is it on this Sunday that you most about your family, about the people that you love, that you would like to bring to the attention of God? God, help our family. What is it? You know, sometimes I think we forget that Jesus was a part of a regular, ordinary family. He was a part of an ordinary family just like you, and it wasn't a perfect family either. Now, sometimes we don't understand that. You may have missed it when I read the story because, well, Matthew's story is so brief. There's not a lot of details there. He only gives us eight verses. That's more than Mark gave us. Mark gives us none. Jesus just says the good news, and Jesus starts preaching. He's an adult. John does a whole bunch of airy theology and no birth narratives. Only Luke gives us all the details and the family drama all around it. But Matthew, just eight verses. And sometimes we miss it because we we focus on the extraordinary events of the story. You know, an angel, we hear prophecy, we hear Emmanuel, and we miss the ordinary parts of the story. But the main reason is we gloss over the heartache in the story. There's a lot of heartache here. And we turn into a Hallmark movie where within an hour and a half all the problems are solved. We turn it into a Christmas card. We cover it with glitter. And we look at the story and we think, oh, it's just one blissful, you know, one blissful baby shower after another. You know, Mary and Joseph are excited. They're going to get married. They fall in love and all this sort of thing. You know, baby shower presents and cribs and all these beautiful things. And we go, but we miss the heartache in the story. Just consider the detail of an engagement in the first century. Engagements in the first century aren't like engagements today where a young lover drops to his knees or her knees on the beach and proposes marriage and hands a ring and then there's all this wonderful planning and wedding showers and all the wonderful planning for a wedding. No, in that culture, it was a legal arrangement. Most likely, their marriage was arranged by family. Most likely, Joseph was maybe 20 years older than Mary. It wasn't a romance is a legally binding contract where two families were bringing two people together to have a family. They didn't fall in love like we see in our culture. And so they were legally married in every way in the moment that they were engaged and the contract was signed, although they did not live together or consummate the marriage until the day that they were officially recognized in their religious community as married. So you have to understand that on hearing the news that Mary was pregnant, Joseph had to conclude the only thing that you could possibly conclude. She was unfaithful. And you can imagine the pain that caused him and the struggle he had believing what she was telling him. So he had a couple of choices. He could publicly disgrace her, declare her unfaithful and committing infidelity, and she could be stoned to death, the penalty of the law, or he could divorce her quietly, which he decided to do. And Mary in all this, she didn't come out unscathed either. She surely knew the pain and the hardship that this would have caused Joseph. And she probably was worried about her own self and her own reputation and wondering if maybe this thing she'd heard from God, maybe she had made it all up. The reality was, it was such a big, big mess and such a heartache. 
I mean, can you imagine the conversation between the two of them as they're talking this out? I mean, you've had those kinds of conversations in your family where people can't agree, right? Can you imagine the conversation? Well, what, how, what? What are we going to do? How, what are we going to tell? How are we going to work through this? How are we going to pay for it? All this stuff, right? It was such a big mess that it took an angel to come down and calm everything down to convince Joseph to do, you know, the right thing. And you'll notice whenever angels show up in the Old Testament and the New Testament, it's always because there's some heavy lifting, well, that needs to be done. It was a mess, an imperfect mess, just like your family. Beautiful, different, imperfect, and, well, a mess. You know, every Christmas, it's true, I stand in the sanctuary and I look at people who are just barely hanging on with all they have just to even be here. Because sometimes in the middle of a family, you can feel lonely and troubled and distressed. And you walk in and you feel like, you know, I'm, I'm the only one that's having these family problems. But the reality is we all do. In every family, there is estrangement. In every family, there are disagreements. In every family, there are problems with kids. Not every kid turns out the way we hope them to be. Kids struggle. I mean, did you ever have a kid in junior high? Oh, my gosh. Junior high? Oh, my gosh. It's a tough time. Kids worried about their future. There are older couples that are facing new challenges. We have several older couples in our congregation who are living in retirement communities where one is living in independent living and the other one is living in dementia care and they're slowly watching the loss of the love of their life over a long period of time. You know, my mom and dad... Uh, my, they were married on December 6th, December 6th. My mom says her favorite Christmas was their first Christmas together. They got married on December 6th. They eloped, got married, and my dad brought home a $1.50 Charlie Brown Christmas tree. She said it was so ugly, but it was the most beautiful tree we ever had. She said, David, you were born the next year. And as much as I love my mom... And my sister loves my mom, and she's surrounded by family. We can never, we will never be able to take away the loneliness that she feels at Christmas for not being with my dad at Christmas this time of year. She told me on the phone the other day that they would have been married 61 years this December. All of us, we all have things that we struggle with. We all have things that trouble us. And I want you to look at this story and remember, again, where is it that God put Jesus in the middle of a family just like yours? Mary was no one special. She was just an ordinary teenager, an unwed girl. Joseph, you know, he was a tradesperson. He wasn't a politician. He wasn't powerful. He wasn't rich. He wasn't famous. He wasn't influential in any way. They had the same family struggles that we all have and put him right in the middle of it. In fact, you know, some of you don't belong to, to, to we, sometimes in the church we focus on traditional families. But did you know Jesus belonged to a step family? Joseph was not raising his biological son. And Jesus had to be a human little boy like every little boy. Can you imagine? Joseph saying, to now Jesus, I told you not to do that. Go to your room without dinner. And Jesus saying, you're not the boss of me. You're not my real dad. <laughs> right? He was a little boy like any other little boy, but he had superpowers. He could do some damage. I mean, they're raising this. You're not the boss of me. God's my boss. Come down off your high horse, young man. Can you imagine the whole conversation? And Mary go, oh, be, you know, the whole, whole, it was this imperfect, 
ordinary family. But what does Isaiah do? I love this. So when you read Matthew and you're reading the scripture, you may not notice who's talking in the narrative. So he's telling the story, and then what Isaiah, what he does, what Matthew does is he, he reaches back to the prophet Isaiah, and he pulls up a text and says, this is who he is. Jesus is Emmanuel. That was a term used by Isaiah. The word I man, name Emmanuel, you know, means God with us. What it means is God really with us. God not with us as we hope to be, not God with us as we want to be, not God with us as we're trying to be. No, God with us as we really are. It's not us trying to reach up or trying to be something different. It means God is really with us. That's the power of this story is that God, when God chose to do this thing, he planted, planted himself in the middle of an ordinary, everyday family so that you would know that whatever it is that's in your family, you're not alone. What that means, do you, hear this, do you hear the good news? That as long as Christ is at work in our world, the good news of Jesus is that you will never, ever be left home alone. I, I read an article this week. It was really, really good. I really recommend it by the columnist David Brooks. I'm not sure if you're familiar with him. He's written some really good books about purpose. He went through a divorce, and it reorganized his life. A couple of good books about it. But he writes every other week an article for the New York Times, and he wrote an article this week called, What Do You Say to the Sufferer, the Person Suffering? The reason he wrote the article, he was giving a talk one day, and uh, after the talk, he passed up cards and had them write down questions that they would like to ask him, and he would answer the questions. He said, usually I get questions about politics, society, morals, values, culture, that sort of stuff. But on one of the cards, <clears throat> it said, what would you say to the person who's been waiting their whole life to be dead? Let me say it again. What would you say to the person who's been waiting their whole life to be dead. He said whoever this person was, he didn't know what their exact situation was, but assumed they'd been through some trauma, that they had struggled their whole life, that they were un just unhappy and was not feeling good about life at all. He said, I didn't answer because I didn't know what to say. What do you say? How do you answer a question? I never want to give him a cliche. So he writes this column about his answer. Go read it. It, it will help you talk to others and it may help you. But here's the thing that grabbed me. He tells the story of a woman who has a brain injury who frequently will fall to the floor with a seizure. The woman says that when she falls to the floor, the mistake people often make is they get in too big of a hurry to rush over and stand her up. She said there's something about falling to the floor as an adult that makes people feel vulnerable and uncomfortable, so they want to help me up. And she said, when I fall to the floor, I don't need someone to stand me up. I need someone to get down on the floor with me. With. God with us. God who got down on the floor with us, those places where we fall. Now in the story, later in the story with Kevin, he walks into a church, sits down in a pew, and an older man walks up and stands next to him, and he's scared of him, because Kevin thinks this older man has killed his whole family. The man sits down next to him, and Kevin explains to him his dilemma. I've been at odds with my family, and now I'm missing my family, and I'm feeling bad about the way I've treated my family. And the old man gives him some great advice. He says this, you know, you get mad at your family, 
But you love them anyway because families are complicated things. Whew. And then the man says, you know why I'm sitting in church on a, on a Christmas Eve in the middle of the afternoon watching a rehearsal? Because that's my granddaughter up there. And I can't come later tonight because my son and I are not speaking. We had an argument several years ago. Our tempers flared. And we have not spoken since. And Kevin says, well, why don't you call your son? And the old man said, well, I would, but I'm scared. And Kevin says, well, aren't you a little too old to be scared, to be afraid? And the old man says, you're never too old to be afraid. He said, I think you should call your son because if you call your son, then at least you'll know. Then at least you'll know. You'll, you'll, you'll have done the right thing. He said, go call your son. Movie ends, heart-touching scene. The family comes home and Kevin and his family are reconciled with one another. They make amends. And then he looks out his window and he sees... The old man with his granddaughter in his arms, hugging his son. I challenge you to watch that scene and not just have the tears rolling down your cheeks. Because Christmas makes us long, long for families. Let me talk directly to someone. I don't know who it is this morning. I don't know what it is in your family, what it is that's keeping you distant or broken, the misunderstanding, the crack or the fissure that caused something to break in your family. But some of you, someone here today, you need to have your heart softened towards someone in your family. Like I said in the text earlier, let your gentleness be known. You need to approach someone in your family with more gentleness and with more respect for whatever it is, the pain that they have and more understanding. Some of you need to put aside your pride and you need to make a call. Some of you need to receive the call that needs to be made. Some of you need to say, will you forgive me? Some of you need to be willing to forgive. It's never too late until it's too late. Take the ornament in your hand, your ornament, and I want you to hold it in your hands like this, okay? I want you to think, what is it today that you're most concerned about your family? This ornament represents someone in your family that needs your prayer today. I don't know who it is. You do. But who in your family today do you need to cradle in your hands in your loving care? Who do you need to hold in your prayers today and say, Lord, this son, this daughter, this mother, this father, this, this member of my family needs your prayers today, needs your love today. What circumstance in your family today do you want God to hold? Just imagine this ornament. Imagine you're holding your family now. Imagine God holding your family. Or maybe it's someone that held you your whole life that's not with you anymore. And maybe today it's time for you just to, to offer them and release them to God. Oh, I know some of you are grieving. It doesn't have to be perfect. But I know that God feels so deeply your grief and your tears. Hold your family now. God, in this tender moment, on this Sunday, Sometimes we speak in such airy terms about Christmas and what it means that we forget. Everything is about our families. And we are so thankful that you are with us, that you got down on the floor with us and became a part of a family, and that you're with us in our family. And today we offer you and bring to your attention 
this person that we hold in our hands now, this situation. Give us courage. Soften our hearts. And let this Christmas be a Christmas when love breaks through. We pray this prayer in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Now take this ornament when you go home and put it on your tree. And every time you walk by it, remember, remember, remember.